Hello everyone, um, good evening. It's wonderful to see so many of you here in real life uh, after months and months of online events uh, and Zooms. It's fantastic um, to see you and I'm delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the How To Academy. Um, also, uh, fantastic to welcome all of you who are signing in um, from home, but it is a particular treat to see so many. Um, sorry, is there a little bit of an echo? Can you hear that? that just, um, there we go, it's gone. A particular treat to see so many real faces rather than always sort of knowing and not quite knowing who's out there. Um, I think knowing and not quite knowing who's out there um, leads me very uh, neatly to what might form the basis of much of our discussion this evening, um, or rather sort of how we come to know, how our brains perceive uh, and experience the world. And, and these are questions that we'll be asking and that fill the pages of the books that have inspired our event this evening. Um, here we go, I'm sure many of you might have them with you now. The Matter With Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and The Unmaking of the World. Um, and they're books, and as you, you will come to see as you read them, they're more than books. They're a, a whole new way of seeing the world and ask some of the most profound questions we really can ask as humans. Uh, who are we? What is the world? And what of our uh, consciousness, uh, matter, space, and time? Um, and given that, I think I should probably wrap up an introduction quite quickly because we have a lot to get through. And as you can see, we also have two um, extraordinary minds um, to engage in these subjects. We have the author of the works himself, psychiatrist, philosopher, uh, and literary scholar, Ian McGilchrist, who's also, of course, the author um, of another book that many of you will know, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain, and The Make Making of the Western World, which... I think we'll also come into our discussion this evening. And with us to explore this, uh, we also have one of our most celebrated minds, the novelist, award-winning novelist, author of uh, 33, probably more than that now, is it, books? Lost count. <laughs> A lot more, lost count. We've all lost count, including, of course, um, his Dark Materials uh, the trilogy. So thank you both very much indeed for being here, and thank you all um, again for joining. Um, Ian... I, I've been watching a, various, a few various interviews that you've done, and I've been watching some of the videos that you've done about the book, and I appreciate that it is, uh, I think you said, as long as the Bible? It's something like that. Very, <laughs> uh, there's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of work, 10 years, but I've also heard mm. that you can do an elevator pitch. <laughs> can I? Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you just to begin by explaining or, or telling us what, what, it, what it is about. Yes. Um, it follows on, in a way, from the um, Master and His Emissary, but it, it, it takes things much further. Effectively, what concerns me is the way we think. Uh, the great philosopher A.N. Whitehead said, as we think, we live. And the very obvious problems that we face in the world in which we live today seem to me to be the products of a certain aspect of the way our brains function. One half of the brain has evolved and specialized to enable us to manipulate the world rather than to understand it. And this part of the brain leads us to believe that all that exists is matter and the way to understand it is to reduce it to the smallest possible parts. I think this is intellectually shoddy. I think it's morally and spiritually bankrupt. And I think it lies behind the folly that we've got ourselves into. I believe that we need, of course, the best, most open-minded science. I'm a passionate defender of science. I'm also a passionate defender of reason, true reason, that is no more than science opposed to intuition and imagination, but in fact dependent on intuition and imagination to do its job. And that these things are not in conflict, and that when you take them together, you find that in fact the right hemisphere of the brain contributes the most important part, what, what any of these um, things mean, what science means, what reason means, what its findings actually mean to human beings, as well as intuition and imagination. And so what I hope to do in this book 
is to argue on a basis of neurology and philosophy supported by the findings of contemporary physics to suggest that we, the world, and indeed the cosmos are not at all the way that they are presented to us by the voices of popular science. A heap of pointless random fragments uh, populated by ourselves who are the playthings of chance engaged in a war of all against all but that instead there is an unimaginably, in fact literally, for the human mind, uh, impossible to fully imagine, but we must make the attempt, an unimaginably rich, complex, beautiful and responsive cosmos. And it's our birthright and I want to reintroduce us to it. Just before I uh, bring you in, Philip, because I know there's so much in there that I'm sure you, you would react to and will explain your interest in the subject. I just, I just want to ask about this synthesis of science and philosophy, because you say you offer a new synthesis of philosophy and science. You say it's um, important in exciting and liberating both parties. So I just wonder if you could explain that, what this um, you know, unifying of science and philosophy means to you and why it's taken so long. Why are they such sort of the opposites otherwise? Well, I think it's a product of the way in which universities work partly and the way in which the Western mind has been trained to think in the last 250 years. It's been said by many great philosophers that the divorce between science and philosophy is a disaster. But in the universities, I think most scientists some are very interested indeed in and knowledgeable about philosophy, but, but probably it's a fair generalization to say that to most of them it's of a secondary level of interest, if any, and threatens to slow them down on the race to the next discovery. What this actually means philosophically is a question that might not even be asked. And indeed I find that talking to some scientists, they're quite surprised and almost a little aggrieved that I should question that the idea that everything is just a mechanism, rather like a pop-up toaster or the bike in the garage. So there's that. And then I think there's also a sort of snobbism of philosophers that somehow they can't learn anything from science. I think both of these are mistaken and unfortunate. And what I've tried to do here is to take what I understand about the nature of the brain. And if we're going to talk about meaning what we can know about ourselves and the world, then the brain's not a bad place to start. And show what the philosophical consequences of the structure and functioning of our brain are. In that sense, bringing science and philosophy to bear. And also, I'm not a physicist, but I'm interested in physics and have um, a, a group of friendly physicists past whom I run my ideas before publishing them to make sure that I'm not completely mad. Um, and really all three of these strands, if you imagine them as sort of points on the surface of a very large sphere, as you sort of drill down, as we say, or go deeper and deeper, you find that they reveal the same patterns. They, they're not in conflict with one another. They all of them tell the same story, which is wonderfully confirming. If three different starting points lead as they go to the center to finding something very similar. That to me is not a proof that it is right, but it is a sign that we might be onto something. And indeed what we find is also in keeping with very ancient wisdom traditions of both East and West. So all in all, that's what I mean by synthesizing science with philosophy physics and neurology with philosophy. And I think that you first um, both sort of encountered each other at the a Blake lecture, which you yes. gave um, in 2016. But before we go into sort of specifics, perhaps you could outline the influence that Ian's thinking and work has had on you since or before then, you and your work and your thinking. Yes. Um, well, I came to um, Ian's Book, the first book, The Master and His Emissary, in about 2010. I think it was published a year before that. Um, it was a revelation um, because I found, <coughs> I found this immensely learned man, this uh, literary scholar, this um, neuroscientist, telling me things that I recognized to be true um, in a brilliantly clear prose. 
That was the big surprise. Um, because having read various works of um, well, popular science and philosophy and so on, um, fields of knowledge that aren't noted for their clear prose, but here was someone explaining with great vividness and brilliance something that I'd been, sort of been conscious of or had felt as if I might be conscious of without really knowing that I was conscious of it. I recognized things he was saying as things I recognized for myself. Now, I, by that time, <clears throat> finished um, my big trilogy, His Dark Materials, and I was engaged on the next series of books I was writing. So I can't say that it had any uh, influence on the first, except that it sort of chimed, it sort of made sense to me. Like Ian, um, I had been very affected, very moved, very um, enlightened and illuminated by poetry. Uh, Wordsworth, as, um, as, as Ian was, but also William Blake. Um, William Blake came to me when I was about 16. Um, I vividly remember the book I first encountered him in. Uh, and what I was enthusiastic about was his insistence on life and energy and so on. Um, Everything that lives is holy. Life delights in life. How do you know but that bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed to your senses five. He was telling me that the world was alive. The world was full of um, energy, full of joy, full of wonder and so on. And I kind of felt this, but I didn't see this reflected in very much modern literature. Um, it was there in music. It was there in um, not only the great works of classical music, but also in jazz, which I love, still love. It's also there in the work of Chuck Berry, for example, in rock and roll. This zest, this energy, this, this life, this pulsating, rhythmical joy in things. That was what I loved and have always done. Um, and that's what I found uh, Ian talking about as well. It was, it was astonishing, really that there was so much um, to say in a sort of neuroscientific way about something that I had felt purely as, um, as a response to art, to poetry. It's so interesting to hear Philip say all of that, having heard you say that, that, that I think is the exact reaction that you very much hope for when you're writing about uh, ideas and thoughts that can't be articulated. I know you've said people have said to you similarly that your work encapsulates ideas they've had that they can't put into words, which brings us to this idea of, of language, because mm. if these ideas can't be articulated, how, how, does one, how does one talk about them? How does one bring them into the world? with great care and difficulty. Um, and that's partly why I've taken so long writing. Um, at the end of the book, I dare to tackle topics such as values, purpose, and the nature of the sacred. And gosh, uh, that cost me so much because as soon as you start talking about the sacred, every word you utter is false. Um, and yet it's so real and true and so important. Uh, in fact, the illusion that it means nothing is carried by the fact that everything stated about it is probably false. So it took me a very long time to articulate it, and one has to both say and unsay. I mean, it sounds like it might be very confusing and, 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 and not really very clearly thought through. I hope the reader will not feel that but we'll see that I'm trying to guide them through a minefield in which to either side of a very important path, there are ways in which one can stray off and into danger, but that following a certain path, being aware of the dangers that beset one in following it, enables one to carry on safely towards some sort of a conclusion. Of course, there is no ultimate conclusion on any of these very big topics. But I always feel that the right way to use language is sort of against itself. And again, that may, might be misunderstood uh, as mere confusion, and I'm certainly not an admirer of confusion. In fact, I 
aspire to a certain kind of clarity, but I always say you can be as clear as you can, but no clearer than that. And that when you start trying to go for greater precision or clarity, you lose it. Because what we're trying to deal with are things for which everyday language hasn't got the right terms. Everyday language has evolved to enable us to tackle practical problems of survival. But we haven't really got an extensive vocabulary for things that language leaves behind. This is why we have poetry. This is the, the point of poetry, is to take language beyond language and therefore make it more rich and more fulfilled as language. But I mean, the point is, I suppose, if, if language and our limited words um, bring us back, as you were saying, music, um, expresses these things better. Jazz, I think you mentioned, and art. But you're a writer, so how, how does that fit? <clears throat> well, Do I think you, you rely have on to, language. It's, it's, it's always been a, a, a curious thing to come up against, the fact that language is a left hemisphere thing and not a right hemisphere. But, but, Poetry but is a sort of I may right. just interject, it's both. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, there, there's a, I find when I write, um, I have to sort of trick the, uh, the controlling, the, 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 the left hemisphere. I suppose that's what's going on. I found a way of doing this quite some time ago. Um, I noticed from the way we read, from the way I read, from the way most people, I suspect, read most things, papers, newspapers, magazines, novels, and so on, I don't read every word, uh, you know, strictly and consecutively. My eye leaps from this word to that and so on. And I noticed once um, that I was looking for things that weren't there because I had misread something that was there. A good example of this, a very good example of this happened when I was reading a, a piece in the New York Review of Books about Philip Roth. Now, as I was reading this <clears throat> in the usual way, skipping and going ahead and not really paying attention. I found myself saying, What's it? hang on, what did he say? What did, this, what did this chap say about Updike? There was something about Updike a minute ago. What was that? I looked back and I couldn't find Updike anywhere. But what I did find was the word at the beginning of a paragraph, the word unlike. And that had put into my mind, and, I'd, and I thought, well, hang on, I can use this. Um, this is something I can do. And from then on, no, actually, it was before that, because I recognized that as an example of what I was already doing. You plant words in the paragraph or the sentence that don't directly relate logically or grammatically to the thing you want to describe, but they surround it with images that will be productively misread by the inattentive reader and suggest the thing that you want to, them to, to imagine. So I, I, I think I'm probably tricking the left hemisphere at that point. <laughs> Is that what he's doing? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, first of all, just to clear out of the way the hemisphere thing, I mean, one of the problems I always have is that people think that, you know, the left hemisphere is language and reason and the right hemisphere is pictures and emotion. And it, it isn't at all like that. Um, they both are involved in, in everything. And indeed, the left hemisphere is not this cool customer that is totally reliable and a little boring like an accountant, but is, is actually <laughs> prone to fits of rage, is extremely uh, capable of being deluded. I mean, the first part of the three parts of the book demonstrates just how deluded the left hemisphere on its own is. But just to say, to clear that out of the way, language has many aspects, of course, doesn't it, Philip? And there's what I found when I was trying to inspire people with a love of literature in Oxford when I was very young, was that the process that Academe sanctioned was to take this object that was full of complexity, full of things that were not being said but were being conveyed. Mm. Um, importantly, they were implicit and they were embodied and they were utterly unique. Yeah. And it took them and turned them into something general, explicit, and disembodied and abstract. And it's this kind of unmagic trick in which, as it were, the beauty of the thing suddenly collapses and you're left with a handful yeah. of dust. 